Hi, Serena. Welcome to this mini podcast thing. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I was seeing like your story and I've seen that you started creating content on LinkedIn more than one year ago and you you you've grew like immensely. So you grew and now you have more than 20,000 subscribers. And by the time you were still a student and then you landed an opportunity with Cox Communications and now you're a university recruiter and you like spoke at international conferences and universities and you did so many things. And in your headline, you had this thing of like, I want to help people find their voice mm -hmm. and also to help students land internships. So yeah, so welcome. Thank you. I'm, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And don't dive into our conversation. Good. And my first question is like, what do you mean by this of helping people find their voice? Mm -hmm. What does yeah, this mean? Yeah, absolutely. So I know that LinkedIn is a little bit different from other social media platforms. And a lot of people mm -hmm. don't even perceive it as a social media platform right now. So everyone who is my age or my generation, they are pretty much on Instagram or on TikTok mm -hmm. or on YouTube. And those are kind of the main platforms that they're on. But LinkedIn, it's one of those platforms where people aren't really sure what to think of because it's very professional. You know, people are taught to make a LinkedIn profile and make their about section, but it's not really the norm to post on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. But as I was becoming more active on the platform and, you know, applying for jobs, doing the regular things that people do on LinkedIn, I saw this opportunity to um, show the personal side of myself and to express my voice on LinkedIn. I did not anticipate like growing to this point at all. Um, and it's been really, truly a blessing. Um, but I was able to actually use LinkedIn as a creative outlet, which is really awesome. Mm -hmm. you know, it was actually in the middle of the pandemic when I started and um, I was able to connect with other like-minded individuals and other content creators who are my age who had already started writing on LinkedIn. So that really helped encourage my journey. You know, I um, was able to talk to like Jonathan Tesser, who was really encouraging. Um, so throughout this whole journey, I realized that, you know, if I can do this, you know, I'm just like a regular student. I went to a state school. I um, am not trying to necessarily go into a super huge tech company or mm -hmm. not even in a technical role. So I consider myself like a pretty normal person. So if I think that I can do this, then anybody else can do it as well. So I really want to be that person who encourages students or, you know, people, maybe even like people who aren't students anymore, people who are in their 20s and their 30s, whatever, to be yeah. able to try writing on LinkedIn um, because it is a different experience. But I think that there are just so many benefits to be unlocked on LinkedIn, like different friendships, job opportunities. Um, I know a lot of people have started their own businesses from LinkedIn. There's just so much visibility and so much organic growth and reach, um, even to the international point that it's it's something that I think people are missing out on. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think it's hard and it's scary sometimes at the beginning when you, mm -hmm. you are like one step behind and you say you're a normal person or, or even sometimes like you always have these, some level of imposter syndrome and you're like, what do I have to say? How can I teach people? So I think you personally, you give a very authentic view and point of yourself to the platform so you can combine this like professional and these like this is still me i'm still a person but this is how i help you and this is what i've been doing mm -hmm. and one thing i always like to ask like how did your journey start we're like yeah i'm just gonna post on this platform and like a lot of opportunities are gonna come or how was that first step yeah yeah so it was a combination of a lot of different things i didn't start writing on linkedin necessarily because i wanted mm -hmm recruiters to see my posts, or I wanted job opportunities right away, or I wanted to um, make money off of LinkedIn, or mm -hmm. even, um, you know, grow to like a, a huge influencer on LinkedIn or anything like that. Um, so I really just started writing because I wanted some sort of creative outlet. And 
Um, I hadn't like quite found the platform that I wanted to write on. You know, I've always been creative my whole life. I've always loved writing. Um, I've always loved photography as well and a lot of other like social media outlets, but I hadn't really found like that platform for me yet. And LinkedIn started becoming um, like, I, I realized that it was a really good fit because one, you don't have to spend like tons and tons of time on the platform when you're first starting out. So for example, on YouTube, you have to spend, you know, hours planning, hours filming, hours editing, hours making the thumbnail, hours like marketing and like mm -hmm. trying to get people to come to your video. But on LinkedIn, you really just have to create an idea for a post and then learn how to copyright. And that just really comes with practicing. Um, and then, you know, obviously reaching out to people and networking and things like that. So I think that there was like a very low um, barrier to entry for writing posts on LinkedIn. Um, but I would say that the whole reason why I like really started in the first place was because I, I saw other people who were kind of in a similar boat as me during the mm -hmm. pandemic. You know, they would just be like writing about their stories on LinkedIn and those are the people who really inspired me to the same. So it was kind of like, you know, I saw people who did it and I was like, you know, if they can do it, why can't I do it too? So it was a little, little bit of that um, helping to jumpstart my journey. Yeah, I, I love that because I think for me it was somehow similar. So I've always liked writing and I've always tried to create blogs and I don't know, like just put my words out there. And mm -hmm. I guess I also kind of found my voice on LinkedIn because it's a platform where people support you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so what would you tell someone that, that goes to you and says, hey, Serena, I really want to start creating content on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to start. So how do I go about it? Yeah. So I would say that the hardest part to starting is really just the mental part of it. I mean, you really just have to start. Um, you might not know anyone else personally in your social circle who's posting on LinkedIn, but you have to be unafraid to just put yourself out there. So, you know, think of it as like any other social media, really just like put your, put your post out there, put your story out there. Um, and so for a lot of students and a lot of people that I coach, I encourage them to talk about their story first. So that's usually the easiest kind of thing to post about on LinkedIn is to make a personal post or to make like a career job announcement post. Um, but we're trying to stay away from job announcement posts here. We're not trying not to let that be the only kind of post that we're posting on LinkedIn. So like, for example, I work with a lot of first generation students and I tell them like, oh, like, you know, you just graduated. Why don't you talk about the fact that you just graduated, you know, post a graduation pic, um, but then also leave some advice for other first generation um, students out there, um, you know, talk about the struggles and the obstacles that you went through because that's really a part of your journey that shouldn't be undermined. And a lot of people would be really inspired to hear that. So yeah. for the first post, you know, you want to give a little bit of value. You want to tell people about yourself, really just break the ice and kind of give this message to other people that like, hey, I'm starting to write on LinkedIn. I'm starting to become a content creator. And um, this is me. Okay, that's great. Yeah, because I think like you always have something to teach other people, but then mm -hmm. you're like, oh, who cares about my story? Who cares about this? Who cares about that? But when you realize that some things that are obvious for you because it's your life and you put them out there and they can help other people and you see the impact, I think from there it just gets easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And now more related to your HR experience. I mean, we all have this thing. Some people have a more straight path. Some people are like, okay, I want these, I want that. I don't know mm -hmm. what I want to do with my life. So since you're helping a lot of students, when you were a student, did you know you wanted to go into HR or how did you mm -hmm. find it? And how would you tell someone to like find what they actually want to do? Yeah, so for me, I... It took a little bit of time for me to find HR, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of different other career paths I was considering before I entered college and realized that those weren't the right fit for me. Um, so when I got to college, I just ended up majoring in psychology and sociology since those were topics that I generally enjoyed. 
And um, from that, I kind of discovered like, oh, I enjoy working in corporate as opposed to academia because it's a little bit more hands on. And then I pursued a lot of different internships related to that. So, you know, with the, the combination of psychology and the combination of um, corporate, you know, that kind of meshes into human resources as a good potential fit. And then um, after doing a couple of HR internships, I realized that, hey, I, I still really enjoy doing this and would like to, you know, continue down this career path. So that's what I did. Um, went into recruiting since HR is obviously like a huge function with a lot of different functions in it. And I chose to specifically go into recruiting, um, at least for the time being. And then, um, yeah, yeah, this is where I am and I'm learning a lot and it's, it's really cool to be able to kind of give back the same knowledge that I've been learning in my position and be able to help other people too, since it's, it's, it's a lot different of an experience being on the recruiting side than being on the candidate side. So it shows me a lot. Um, yeah. 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 And I think like you, you learn a lot of the best practice when you are behind. Yeah. Because like, then you're like, you can teach them as well in your posts and everything. So it's like different, but somehow we're like playing this game. I feel mm -hmm. like recruiting now is, it's also like selling. It used to be yeah. like the other way around. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's quite funny. Yeah. Yeah, so, recruiting is yeah, absolutely selling. We talk about it like all the time in the recruiting world because we're essentially selling the company. We are like salesmen for mm -hmm. our company and our jobs. So I know that like a, a good recruiter can like make or break whether you want to continue with interview rounds or not. And it um, like a good recruiter will like help make the close easier, um, like be able to convince mm -hmm. you a little bit better to join the company and things like that. So yeah, there's a definitely a lot of a lot of selling aspects to my role, a lot of like persuasion tactics as mm -hmm. well. Um, and there's like a little bit of that psychology that plays behind it too. So it's kind of cool to see that part of my college education being used for this role. Yeah, it's good that, that your major can actually make you better in your job. Yeah, definitely. Do you see like there's a specific personality that would fit recruiting? Um, yeah, yeah. There definitely is. Um, so have you heard of the DISC assessment? No, I haven't. So um, there, it's D-I-S-C and like mm -hmm. it stands for like dominant. I forgot what the I stands for, but there's like, um, I think the S is stability and then the C is conscientiousness. But mm -hmm. um, I was talking to like someone the other day and they were talking about how most um, recruiters kind of land in the area of being a little bit more dominant. So they are people who, you know, enjoy being social. You don't necessarily have to be like super extroverted. I know there are mm -hmm. like plenty of recruiters actually who are introverts, um, but they have to be someone who's not afraid of confrontation. That's something I'm still like trying to learn. And um, yeah, I know that there are some people who, you know, they're like very dominant, very confrontational, um, but they're also like very sociable and they love like talking to people about their positions. And that that's typically the kind of personality that I've heard and seen works really well for recruiting positions. Okay. Th that's really interesting. This mm -hmm. year I've also like been studying a lot. I was like obsessed with, you know, the Maya Briggs as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the 16 personalities. And mm -hmm. then I realized like each person has one and each company has one. Sometimes they cannot be like outside, but if you think there's like a similarity in the people mm -hmm. inside the company. So sometimes you may consider one company and then you go and people are like, I mean, you would kind of adapt yourself mm -hmm. when you go inside that company. Yeah. So like, it, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. And I yeah. love that you said that. And I think everyone should go check that and to go do that test. Yeah. And so like, imagine like someone wants to get into HR because I think now, even when the, with, with this talent and the selling approach and everything that's going mm -hmm. behind the field, people want to help other people land jobs. So for someone that wants to go into the HR fields, what do you think are like some steps they should take? Yeah, definitely. So there are a few steps. Oh, is this for like students? 
I would I would assume. Yeah, for okay. students. Okay, so for students, you know, if you're still in college and university, there are a lot of different steps that you can take. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, of course, the most obvious is majoring in uh, an HR related major. So HR, um, sometimes it's called like human resources management. Um, you can have a management degree, a business degree. Um, generally, any kind of that degree w is like directly what um, companies would look for. Um, in my personal case, I did not get the opportunity to get into the business school because I was like already majority like finished with my other um, uh, credits for my other degrees. So I just decided to like stick it out and not have to like go through the whole process of adding on a business degree. So what I did instead was I um, added on a couple of certificates. So I had a certificate from my business school, which was in personal and organizational leadership. And then I also had another certificate in diversity. So that helped out to, you know, help give me some connections and exposure to um, the corporate world. And then one of the other important things that I did was um, be involved in my school's and HR chapter. So here in the U.S., um, one of the big organizations for human resources is called SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Management. So that was really important to get to be a part of. Um, it was actually like a pretty small club and it was great being able to um, like talk to people who had already had like a lot of HR internships before and they would bring in like recruiters to speak to our company. Mm -hmm. So it was a really great opportunity to network with them, get mentors, but then also like get internships and job opportunities. So, you know, I got a couple of like interviews through that club as well, met some friends. Um, and then if your school doesn't have an HR society necessarily, that's totally fine. You can start one. Um, I know a friend who started one at their own school and, mm -hmm. or you can um, maybe join like a local chapter if that's possible or just try to do like HR related things in extracurriculars. So, you know, you could be like a recruitment chair or a membership chair of your sorority, or you could, um, you know, help out with the like engagement activities for a particular organization that you're a part of. So, you know, there are a lot of HR components um, when it comes to leading organizations and extracurricular activities. So I would definitely try to incorporate some of those HR functions in there so you can pop them on your resume. Okay. I, I love that because I love what, when you say that, okay, if you do this, you should go, you can go into HR, but even if you don't, there's other ways to, mm -hmm. to get there because not everyone, maybe they don't know what they want to do early on or maybe like they change ideas in between or maybe right. like you figure out later so there's always a way to, yeah to get there even if you don't come for like the most obvious path right yeah right. exactly yeah and i know like you talk a lot about these you don't need these to be successful you don't need a high gpa to be successful you don't yeah. need to go to a fortune 500 etc etc yeah so like i think those things can give you an unfair advantage but if like going to target school and going to a fortune 500 and like gpa is kind of overrated what do you think like actually makes someone stand out when they are in the interview process yeah great great question so uh, number one for me like as a recruiter um the first thing i look for is passion so you know if you've already passed the resume screening round that probably means that you have the minimum qualifications and skills that we're looking for you just have to like prove to me that like, yes, you have those skills, but then most importantly, you have passion for the position. So if you're talking to me, like if I'm recruiting for say, like a, a project management role, and you're just talking to me about how you love coding, you like being on the back end, you don't really like talking to people, then I'll be like, hmm, I don't think you're really a fit for this role. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of like matchmaking and seeing what skills um, align with the particular like position that you're applying mm -hmm. for. But um, yeah, like passion is a huge one. So for example, like some ways that you can show how passionate you are for the position is by 
um, knowing what that specific role does at the company. So make sure that you know what the company does and then know like what this role might potentially do. And like the only, mm -hmm. you can really just learn that by reading the job description. Like, hello, just, just read the job description and then you'll get a good idea of what the role does. Um, so definitely you want to do your research before you enter an interview. And then you also want to like watch your tone. So you want to kind of come off as really excited about the position. Um, try not to be like monotonous, you know, be on the social side a little bit, try to establish a good connection with the recruiter. Um, that way they can say like, oh, you are, I think you would be like a good fit for this team because you are very collaborative and um, you're outgoing or something like that. Not saying that like everyone has to be outgoing, but um, I know that that can come out of everyone um, at any given time. And then um, the last way that you can show passion for the position is by asking really insightful questions. So this is like one of the distinguishing factors I see among students. Um, I get a lot of questions that are like very standard. You know, the first question that a lot of students ask is um, regarding I think what if the internship program is going to be like remote or in person? It's like, okay, I get that you're asking that question, but that's kind of a boring question. You know, <laughs> if you ask me like very specific questions that other people don't mm -hmm. ask, and I say, like, oh, that's a that's a really good question. I've never been asked that before, then that definitely gives you like more points in my book. Okay. And so in following your last thoughts, what are the most interesting questions you've been asked? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Or did someone can ask? There have been some good ones. Um, and I think it's like about the way that you ask the question too. Like there have been some people who ask like, oh, what's your, what's your favorite part about the company? And then there are people who kind of like add their own spin on that question. So let me see if I can try to like come up with one right now, but some people will say like um what what attracted you to the company and what made you stay or like um of all the different companies out there like why do you choose isims um what are some other really good ones i've had um yeah I, I, those are the ones i can think of off the top of my head <laughs> I like that. So research, passion for the company, match the skills, and last time you say the human factor. I mm -hmm. think that's so important, especially to to show interest. And even in the questions they ask, they can be like, "Okay, Zarina, so now you're working for Wex. You, you've worked for Y. So why, what made you stay there? Like, what's your favorite things about that?" And then you give your your own perception. Mm -hmm. And like in relation to the relation to the regard to the skills, since you, like. You are a university recruiting recruiter, so you like talking with a lot of students, seeing their resumes, and I'm aware that they might not have the largest resume in terms of mm -hmm. experience they had. Yeah. So, how would you advise someone to like go about when they have absolutely no experience? What can they do, like with their resume, right, LinkedIn, right. if they do so, interview? Yeah. 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 So, you definitely want to try to keep your resume to one page and like fill up the whole space. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the sections that you can include are, you know, you always have your education section on top. Um, you can have a project section, you can have a skills section, your experience section. Um, doesn't ha necessarily have to be work per se. It can be mm -hmm. like any, any like related experience that you have. Um, you can put volunteering, you can put leadership experience. That's definitely a huge one. Um, and then you can also include a summary too, for example, like you can say my, I have like X number of years of experience in maybe customer service or something like that. And you can say, I'm looking to go into X role in X industry. So that demonstrates to me like clearly like, okay, and this is your purpose of applying for this position as opposed to giving the impression that you're just like sending your resume off to a lot of different companies. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can put in your resume. Um, um, projects is like a huge one, as I said before. Mm -hmm. And when I say projects, it can be 
not only classroom projects that you do with like on a team or even individually or like big milestone projects um, mm -hmm. that you do for your classes, but they can also be personal projects that you do in your free time. So for example, if you're trying to get into a software engineering internship, a really cool thing would be to see if you've like developed your own app, for example, or like, you know, created your own website, things like that. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because there's like these cycle, right? Like no experience, no job, no experience, no job. Yeah. And I, yeah, I mean, and like you need experience to get a job and to land your first opportunity. You don't, you didn't have a job before. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, so you could add potential like apps you created or some projects from class, some volunteer, something like that, and it would count as well. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Like you have to, you know, use what you have right now. Uh, one of the problems I see a lot of students do is that they kind of underrepresent themselves on their resume. You know, I'll talk mm -hmm. to them face to face and they'll talk to me about like all these super cool things that they're doing in school and they're doing in their personal lives. And I'm like, mm -hmm. why the heck is this not on your resume? <laughs> you know, your resume is like half blank. Um, there aren't any metrics on here. It doesn't look very impressive, but when I talk to you in real life, it, you're very impressive. So yeah, I, I think it's all about like getting that objective perspective, you know, like for example, going to your career counselor and asking them like, hey, how can I, beef up my resume. Um, you mm -hmm. know, if students haven't even gone to their career center and gotten a resume review, then that's something that they need to do. <laughs> and then they can go to like professors and mentors and things like that to get their resume reviewed. So yeah, you, you want to make sure that your resume is the best representation of yourself that you can possibly be. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of students who don't have, you know, any work experience per se, like successfully navigate into really competitive internships and full-time positions because they were able to show their leadership and their soft skills and their passion for the position on their resume. Um, so that just goes to show like, you know, you don't have to have an internship experience already in order to, you know, work for a really good company. Yeah, yeah, I love that because when I first applied for my first positions, I, I mean, I had one internship, but it was just like part time, and the rest was volunteer experiences and mm -hmm. project experiences. Right. So, I mean, you can also do that, and even like coffee, you can if you can translate it to match the skills, then mm -hmm. it's already a plus. Exactly. And yeah, the other day I was seeing like a, a TikTok from Madeline Main. She's uh -huh. a career coach. You probably yeah. know her, and she was saying what makes you stand out, and it was something so funny. They was like, okay, just read the job description and <laughs> make sure that you match the skills because you're already like in front of more than 80% of the people they applied because they do not read the job description and just send something random. Right. So yeah, I love that you say that. And I was also found funny because I read something that you wrote. I don't know if you, it was on your yearly review or something. You were like, uh, most of the job or recruiter is like nodding your head or something like this when you see some things and you're like yeah no. and I was like mm -hmm. that's so accurate <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I mean you don't know what you don't know and sometimes you need that recruiter or professional to tell you like hey um sorry to say this but your your resume kind of kind of needs some work so <laughs> I've definitely seen some of those resumes and it just makes me be like oh, I wish you knew <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that. And even me, I was scared to ask like for help. But especially mm -hmm. when you're a student, I think you have so many resources, like yeah. the career, the career coaches and your professors and even your peers, they might know something that you don't. So right. this feedback culture like is what helps you improve. Mm -hmm. And OK, so I have two, la two more questions for you. And so the next one is basically, I think and I see this and I leave this, that job search is an over an overall like emotional process. It's mm -hmm. an emotional fight. Yeah. So how would you say and what do you think helps someone like keep the balance, like their mm -hmm. mental health, uh, job searching and like their personal life? How do they deal mm -hmm. with it? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so the first thing is to recognize that your career isn't your only identity. 
in life. Um, I, it's, it's definitely a huge part of your life. You know, you definitely need it in order to you know, have a means to live. And you're spending like eight hours a day at your, at your job. So, you know, it's definitely important to invest in it and to take the time to, you know, be intentional about what kind of career you want. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're not just a machine, you know, you still have to get that eight hours of sleep or more, depending on who, you, what kind of person you are. So, you know, make sure you have like healthy systems in place during your job search. Um, and that includes, you know, exercise that includes, um, you know, your social life, um, that includes, um, eating right. So of those three, you know, I think a lot of people, um, neglect the social support system the most during the job search. So they'll just like be sitting at home applying for jobs and then, you know, not going out to hang out with their friends every so often, or not like catching up with other friends on the phone and things like that. So, when you're on your job search, it's especially important to have extra support. So identify those people in your in your life who are also going through the job search and be accountability partners. Or think about any older friends that you have who, you know, have obviously gone through the job search themselves and are in full-time positions right now. Um, reach out to them and ask for their advice. Um, I've done that personally and it was very, very helpful and very encouraging. Um, yeah. And also just being able to reach out to friends who can kind of get you out of the mindset of job searching is really important too. And, you know, just have some fun outside of job searching. Mm -hmm. um, but on the same realm of that, try to make your job search as fun as possible. So for example, like one way to make it fun is to do those coffee chats and network with other people. Um, those coffee chats shouldn't necessarily be with the intention of planning a job right away per se, or like even getting an interview, but you can just mm -hmm. use it as a way to like meet other people who could potentially be mentors or really just to learn from them and to be inspired by them. So I really enjoyed doing coffee chats as a part of my, of every single job search process I've done. It's been very eye-opening to me. And um, through each conversation you have with a professional, you can learn more about the role, more about the company, and just see like what motivates people to be in that position. Um, like I had this like, I have had like several extremely like inspirational conversations with people who are like 10, 20, 30 years into recruiting. And it's just, amazing because I aspire to be like them too and to have such a passion for recruiting. Um, yeah. So take that time to form those friendships. Um, you know, maybe even post on LinkedIn. I know some people like to journal their, um, their job search process and then, you know, have people celebrate with them in the end. So that's really fun too. Like, again, like having that creative outlet on the side, kind of like a hobby to accompany your job search process. That was also something that was helpful for me. Yeah, I think I think that's that's a great advice and really fun because you basically saying that you can see job search as like this sort of game that you play that you should have fun, talk with people, this mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great mindset shift because if you just think like, okay, I don't have a job, let me get a job and just stay there like twenty four seven, mm -hmm. you're probably gonna burn out even before you have a job. So exactly. That's not worth it. Just go travel as well and yeah. things in between. And and I love when you said also systems because mm -hmm. you need to have your foundations clear with yeah. these. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Okay, so last question. Uh, imagine that you have all the powers in the world right now and you can make a rule that everyone has to follow. What would the rule be? The rule? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I'm trying not to say something cliche like, oh, be nice to everyone or mm -hmm. blah, blah. <laughs> um, I would say that rule would be for people or that people would have to talk to people 
of different backgrounds. So maybe I make a rule that like once a month you have to have like a 30 minute chat with someone who's completely different from you. Um, and the reason I say this is because um, like even from my experience on LinkedIn, I've met people mm -hmm. who are so different from me. I've met people, for example, who are students in Malaysia and they tell me about their experience. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that is so interesting. Like I never knew that um, this brand of ice cream was sold there or something like that. And then, you know, I've met people who are of different like social economic statuses as me, people of different ethnic backgrounds, um, people of different ages. And it's just so fascinating to like hear about someone who's like outside of your social circle, outside of your bubble, mm -hmm. outside of the kind of person that you run into every day. So yeah, I think that would help people see themselves in the big picture if they talk to people and had deep conversations with people who were different from them. Because we, we naturally attract people to talk to us who are very similar to us. Um, but I think there's just so much benefit in being able to have friends and have conversations with people who are not similar to you in any way. I love that. I see a lot of people being in out of the comfort zone if that happens. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I think you have this like similarity principle. You attract people that are similar to you and then you just stay inside the bubble. Mm -hmm. So I think that would also help people be nicer, like indirectly. Yeah. Be like, okay, we are different, but we are still people. We are all just people. Right. So right. it would help like yeah. develop a sense of empathy and um yeah, just being able to understand where other people are coming from. Yeah, I love that. Serena, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for all your answers. I'm sure they will help a lot of people. And thank you for your posts and to help us like be more balanced as well. Not just like work, work, but we are more. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate you and I really appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, and absolutely. It, yeah. it was awesome having this conversation with you. Thank you. And have an amazing week. Thank you. You too. See you. All right. Take care.